I was told the lights would be dimmed. They're very bright. So good evening, everyone. Since January, the local action team and residents of Medicine Hat have been working diligently to develop solutions that address the needs of our community. Whether participating in Strong Towns Book Club meetings, the public library, joining the Strong Towns Local Conversation Group. Anyone here from the Local Conversations Group? Whoop! feel like they deserve a cheer because they're so great and thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> following uh, lessons at the Strong Towns Academy, all of these groups um, looked to how we could make our community a better place by having people step up and learn what we can do, each of us. Whether renting or buying your first home or looking to downsize, the housing crisis has affected all of us in one way or another. Rising interest rates and inflation all across the board has had an impact on our housing costs. Mixing that in with supply chain, availability of materials, cost of materials, uh, things are getting uh, pretty hard. To ensure a bright future for our city, we must ensure we face this housing crisis head on. But the solutions to this dilemma won't be handed down to us from above, the provincial or the federal government. These solutions need to be homegrown to reflect our own local needs, which is exactly why it's crucial that we all play a role in this together. So once again, I thank you for participating with us while we come to a close of our first year of this Community Action Lab. And as a reminder, another Strong Towns event is taking place tomorrow at 1 p.m. at the Public Library Theater on the topic of mobilizing our community for grassroots change. Please join us there if you would like to learn more, um, whether it's grassroots change with Strong Towns or just you have something that, that you're really passionate about. And we've seen lots of grassroots movements in our city this year. And that's, that is what democracy looks like. We, um, as a community coming together and um, having shared values and working together to achieve uh, the goals that we have together. Um, and finally, our local conversation group is hosting an informal discussion tonight, right after the, tonight's presentation at McNally's Tap House, which is very near here. So there's really no excuse for not coming. So please join us if you want to continue the conversation. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming our speaker for tonight's presentation, Fixing the, crisis, the Housing Crisis Here at Home, founder and president of Strong Towns, Chuck Marin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It is, it is very, very nice. You better sit down, pal. Um, <laughs> that's my colleague, Norm. Um, it is really nice to be back here. Um, a couple things right off the top. First, uh, we're going to talk housing tonight. And I just hit send uh, yesterday morning. Uh, on the manuscript on the Third Strong Towns book, which is 80,000 words about housing. And if you've ever done a project like that, where you've had to be immersed in something for 12 months and then stand up the next day and talk about it, um, my challenge tonight is, not, is going to be doing a nice hour and change as opposed to everything that's in my brain. So we're going to work on that one together. Norm, you're going to keep me on track. You're going to be like, move it along here, buddy. Um, the second is... Uh, we have been uh, engaged here in Medicine Hat for a year, and I, I'm going to tell you two things, and we're going to talk about this a little bit at the end, um, but I'm going to tell you two things right off the top, and I don't say this, uh, I, I, I'm a Minnesotan, I'm, it kind of makes me congenital, uh, congenitally unable to lie to large crowds, so I'm going to tell you something in very like deep, deep honesty, I love this place, I really, really do. And I know I felt a little bad today because I was in a conversation and someone said, if you Googled Medicine Hat, you get all kinds of negative things. I'm like, really? Uh, I feel like this is one of the most exciting places uh, that we have been, that we have been able to come to and work with. I adore your mayor. I love your staff. Um, you have some of the hardest working people 
around. And uh, it has been a pleasure to be here and to be engaged with this community and to be part of the conversation going on here. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, all of y'all here at the end, but let's, let's get started. When we think about housing today, there are really two conversations going on. And there are two conversations that are exclusive of each other. There's a conversation about housing as an investment product, uh, a, a conversation that involves uh, prices and pricing and uh, mortgage-backed securities and stock prices and interest rates. And there's another conversation about housing that is going on that is about housing as shelter. How do we get people into homes? How do we get people into homes they can afford? How do we help people uh, find a place where they can shelter? These two conversations are going on parallel to each other. And they're reaching uh, kind of this fevered pitch uh, this is a crisis, that's a crisis, this is about to implode, that's about to fall apart. Um, the interesting thing about these two conversations is that they really don't overlap. Uh, I just showed you a bunch of the housing crisis, now we get into the CNN business. Housing slump likely to continue. Uh, home prices could plunge 20%. Housing slump is expanding. These two conversations go in vastly different directions. And if we stop and think about them for a second, one conversation is concerned that housing prices are going to fall. And the other conversation is concerned that housing prices are going to rise. Um, in fact, it, when we poll people, when we ask them what they want, lots of people are very, very concerned about housing. But there's kind of a split between the people who are concerned that housing is going to go down and the people who are concerned that housing prices are going to go up. Here's... I think the important thing for us to recognize right off the bat, housing cannot be both broadly affordable and an indefinitely appreciating investment instrument. It, it can't actually be both. We, we can't live in a world where housing prices must fall in order for people to have shelter. And then housing prices cannot be allowed to fall because as an investment instrument, it is central to our economy. These two things cannot exist simultaneously yet we live in a world where we kind of pretend with each other that they can exist simultaneously. When I was here in January and we had a, a very nice conversation, I showed you some photos of my hometown. I, I'm going to show you the same three photos again, uh, but I want to talk about them a little differently this time. Because when we look back at kind of the history of housing here in North America, um, what we often and I think because we're human, because we look at things through our, our, our own current lens, what we often fail to recognize is that 100 years ago, give or take, 100 years ago, housing was abundant and it was affordable. It was also really, really junky. It was, I was going to use a swear word there, but we don't do that amongst friends, right? Um, it was a very low quality, right? When we look at housing 100 years ago, we didn't have a problem with people getting shelter. In fact, if you listen to uh, the progressive movement at the time, the things that they were concerned about was not that there were homeless people or that people couldn't get a house. People couldn't find a place to stay. Housing was abundant. I mean, you could find a place. You could show up at someone's house. They put a little sign out front and in the evening uh, do a like, bed and breakfast. We think of bed and breakfast today as like the quaint place you go on vacation. A bed and breakfast was literally like someone had a room that you could stay in. They would put a little sign out front. You would show up in the evening, give them, you know, a nickel or a dime or whatever. They let you sleep in the bed, and then in the morning, they'd give you a sack with a meal in it and send you on your way. That was very, very, very common. The problem with housing 100 years ago, and we see this in the progressive movement to the progressive literature around housing uh, was that it was very low quality, very, very low quality. So when I show you these photos of my hometown in, in its early, early days and kind of allude to the notion that medicine had at one point had a development pattern very similar to this, um, what we're looking at is a kind of bottom-up, complex, adaptive kind of system that would have both very high-quality housing, very high-quality buildings, adjacent to buildings of lesser quality, and that would be adjacent to buildings of very, very poor, poor quality. Um, I'm going to give you a sense of how poor the quality was. Uh, in, in New York City, 
uh, there was a, a series of laws that were passed in the early 1900s to deal with tenement structures. And uh, one of them had to deal with egress windows. They wanted to make sure that the, every, every unit had an egress window. Uh, but prior to that, they were building units where like, there would be no, out windows were expensive, right? So there were no outside windows on these buildings. And if the building went up, there was no way to get out except for the, the one stairs or what have you. And so they said, every unit has to have an egress window. So the developers at the time said, okay. Uh, and they would put one window, exterior window on the end unit, one exterior window on the other end unit, and then all the interior ones would have uh, interior windows which meant that if you had to exit and you couldn't get out the door, uh, you would climb through a hole in the wall to get to your neighbor's apartment and then another hole in the wall and then another hole in the wall until you got to the egress window on the end. Uh, reforms said, nope, everybody has to have an outside window. Uh, things like that were going on in the early 1900s. Um, then we hit uh, this period of time called the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, a lot of things, um, and I'm going to, pause here for a second. I realize that I am in Alberta, Canada. I realize that you all are kind and generous Canadians. Um, I'm going to confess something. I put some Canada-specific things here towards the end, but a lot of my narrative is very U.S.-focused. You, you don't get inundated with U.S. culture here, do you? That's a very uncommon thing. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I apologize because I know that the world is American-centric and I'm coming here as an American, having written a book about uh, the U.S. housing market. Um, I, 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 from, I have taken the time to uh, try to understand the dynamics here as much as I can and there's a lot of things that rhyme. I don't know the specifics of how you handled housing in the Great Depression. I don't know the specifics about how you handled housing in the 50s and 60s. I'm going to give you the U.S. story for how we handled this, um, but I will tell you that the outcomes look extremely similar. Uh, the situation is very, very, very similar, and I'll show you some of that at the end when we get into the finance part. And every time that I have delved into a specific place, what you did rhymes with what we did. It's very, very, very similar. So when we hit the Great Depression, um, one thing that we experienced right away were, uh, along with the bank runs and the insolvencies in local financial institutions, was a huge uh, downward pressure on housing prices. Um, in the Great Depression, or really prior to, in the decades prior to the Great Depression, if you were going to have a mortgage, that mortgage was going to be at a local bank. And because local banks are not able to, and this is important because it recurs over and over in this conversation, because local banks cannot take long-term interest rate risk, local banks can't loan you money for 20 years, 30 years, what local banks would do is they would say, we will give you a three-year or a five-year loan, something in that range, with a balloon payment on the end. And what that allowed the bank to do is essentially hedge their risk, right? If I'm taking depositors' money, and the depositors can come in and get it at any time, I have to have depositors' interest rates adjust with the market. I have to be able to adjust the people I lend to with the market as well. So very typical that a mortgage would be 50% down payment. So you would have a lot of skin in the game when you bought a house with a mortgage. 50% down payment. And of the 50% that the bank would lend you, they would lend it to you, let's say, a five-year with a balloon payment on the end. And in fact, in those five years, you might only pay interest on the loan, pay no equity down, just interest payment. When we hit the Great Depression and housing prices fell, they fell for natural economic reasons. There weren't as much buyers in the market. And even if the market had worked out just fine, there weren't enough buyers. There were more sellers than buyers. And so prices dropped. This caused uh, a deflationary spiral, is what economists would call it. So you own a house, you are able to make your payments. Uh, maybe you have been able to keep your job during the depression, you have income, you're able to make your payments, but all of a sudden your balloon comes due. And your house, which used to be valued at $1,000, is now valued at $800. Well, your $1,000 home, you had borrowed half of that, $500. Now the bank at an $800 home is only going to lend you 800, or half of 800 
So you owe 500, they're only going to lend you 400. You have to come up with $100 of cash in the Great Depression in order to stay in your home. People couldn't do that. And so even though they could continue to make the payments, even though they continue uh, to, in a sense, finance the house, they could have stayed in it had the bank been willing to roll that over, the banks were unwilling to take that much risk. And so the bank would foreclose on the home. What happens when a bank forecloses on a home? It's not like the bank executive moves in and like they have a party, right? What does the bank do? The bank has a house that they have to get rid of. So the bank turns around and tries to sell it. They put it on the market. What happens when you try to sell houses in a depression? Yeah, prices go down even more. And so the next person whose house rolls over in that five-year balloon they have even less equity now. They have to come up with even more cash. Their house gets foreclosed. Their house gets foreclosed, sold on the market. What does that do to housing prices? It drops them down even further. And so you have this spiral down where every increment down puts more and more people into foreclosure, driving the market lower and lower and lower. This is what happened in the Great Depression. It caused bank runs. It caused, it, 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 it caused lots and lots of people to get kicked out of their homes for no reason, uh, they were willing to make the payments. They could make the payments. Uh, they just got trapped in this debt system. And so when in the United States, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was elected president, uh, one of the first things he did was establish the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And the Homeowners Loan Corporation was designed to do a couple of things. The first thing is that it went to local banks and it said, whoa, 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 whoa. stop kicking people out of their house. We, the federal government, will insure that loan so that you don't have to shoulder that risk. Go ahead and make a loan with less equity, right? Because why does a bank require you to have equity? So you don't walk away from the mortgage, right, and just leave the bank with the house. They want you to have some skin in the game. They said, go ahead and require less skin in the game. Go ahead and require less equity. We, the federal government, will insure that extra risk. So if they do default, we'll make you whole, the local bank. You're not going to lose money. Your depositors are not going to get, you know, lose their money. Go ahead and, and, and do that. That will work out fine. The second thing that the federal government did is they said, if you have a home that you have foreclosed on, um, instead of kicking the person out, we will buy that loan from you. We, the federal government, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, will actually purchase that loan from you and then we will turn around to the homeowner and say, how would you like to stay in your home? Instead of a five-year mortgage with a balloon payment on the end, we, the federal government, will do a 20-year mortgage. And instead of having a balloon payment, you'll pay equity down every month. So at 20 years, you will own it clear and free. And guess what else we'll do as a federal government? We'll do it at interest rates that are below the market interest rate. What this did is it put a floor on that deflationary spiral. It stopped housing prices from collapsing. The federal government stepped in, provided insurance, and provided a market for foreclosed properties that allowed people to stay in their homes and not have the housing market continue to collapse and get more and more people kicked out of their homes. In many ways, this was one of the most, I think, moral and compassionate things that a society could do. This was the Great Depression. At the end of World War II, we faced an entirely different scenario. And I, I shared this slide with you last time. I'm not going to go into the length of conversation we had about it before, except to say, to remind you what I said last time, which is the big fear of economists at the end of World War II uh, was that we were going to slide back into depression. When we demobilized millions of troops, when we shut down all the industries of war, uh, the, 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 the industries that were making ships and planes and boats and munitions and all this stuff, when we shut that down, economists were convinced that we were just going to slide right back into the Great Depression. What I talked about last time was that we didn't do that, right? We turned cities into engines of growth, machines of growth. And I talked about the way we finance infrastructure and highways and all this. One of the other things that we did in parallel to make cities this machine of growth 
is we said, um, we can take these tools, the tools that stop the deflationary spiral, we can take these tools and repurpose them to make the market go up. In other words, in order to stop the market from going down, we establish things like lower down payments, insurance, longer payment cycles. In order to get more and more people into housing, in order to expand the housing market, in order to make prices go up, we can take those same tools and just reconfigure them. We can go from 20-year loans to 30-year loans. We can go from 20% down payment to 15% down payment or 10% down payment or ultimately to, to no down payment. Instead of going uh, for interest rates that are slightly below market, we can do 1% or 2% or 3% below market. This is what we did. And it, it completely juiced the economy, right? It created a nation of homeowners. It built a middle class it created uh, lots and lots and lots of wealth. I showed you this map last time I was here. This is Fresno, New York. Fresno, New York. Fresno, California, sorry. Um, if you remember, uh, I said, I'm not sharing this map with you because I have a fetish for Fresno or because I think you are Fresno, but because I have a really good map of Fresno. Um, I want you to see again that development shift. So the idea was we would grow very, very quickly, right? This is that incremental pattern up to the end of World War II. And then after World War II, we have the very rapid, rapid, rapid development pattern. Uh, the interesting thing is that when we look at the building permits here in Medicine Hat, when we look at the way that you have annexed land and we hook that up over time, uh, you have the same exact development pattern, right? The same exact thing happened here, happened in Calgary, happened in Edmonton, happened in Winnipeg, as we have, saw happen to cities uh, all throughout the United States. Let me talk about that uh, uh, J.C. Dickel's planning for permanence notion. Um, J.C. Nichols uh, was a, I think in today's terms you'd call him a developer. Um, I think he had a fancier title back then. Um, this is a guy who was one of the founders of the ULI, which is a big... Uh, builders organization that is still very active across the United States. They give a J.C. Nichols Award for innovation every year. Um, J.C. Nichols gave a kind of seminal speech uh, to a bunch of real estate agents, basically a bunch of property developers. Um, and the title of the speech was called Planning for Permanence. Um, it's one of those kind of post-war milestones. And in the speech, he talked about the idea that uh, we no longer had to build cities in this incremental, messy way. We no longer had to uh, have low standards of housing. We no longer had to have buildings that people would occupy and then we'd tear down and redevelop. We no longer had to have neighborhoods that would expand incrementally the way we talked about last January. We could build things right the first time. We could build things of such high quality and such high value that they would, in a sense, be permanently prosperous. And we had the capacity to do this because at the end of World War II, our two countries were the wealthiest countries in the world. We were countries that had not been decimated by war. We had never been occupied. We had never been bombed. We had all kinds of reserves. We had all kinds of natural resources. We had ridiculous amounts of developable land. And all we needed to create a permanent prosperity in North America was the vision and the will uh, to look out and to recognize that if we just built things of high quality, of course, you know, the government would finance it, the government would lubricate it, make it all possible, private sector would build these things. Uh, if we could build this of such high quality that we could create for ourselves this permanent prosperity. This is where you get this massive shift in the development pattern, right? I'm going to remind you of something we talked about in January, but I'm not going to dwell on it. It's that trade-off that we have. If you remember, I showed you this stats from Lafayette, Louisiana, where they were able to grow their population by three and a half times, but their liabilities by 10 times and 20 times. As we grow in this post-war pattern, as we uh, develop and build, what we see is that uh, local governments, in particular, are able to generate a lot of free cash. They're able to have permit fees and hookup fees 
uh, additional property tax, uh, additional sales tax, all the revenue that comes along with new growth. Uh, this is why we hear local governments everywhere be very, very obsessive about how do we attract new business? How do we attract new residents? How do we attract new homes? Um, because all the new stuff creates lots and lots of immediate cash flow advantages for us. But as cities, we take on, of course, the long-term liability of fixing all that pipe, fixing all those roads, maintaining all that stuff. And we do it uh, despite not having sufficient tax base to take care of all this, right? The more we grow, particularly the more we grow outward, the more we expand our liabilities with a correspondingly uh, denuded or diluted tax base. Um, this is, again, one of those stories of the North American development pattern. When you play that out over a generation, it works really, really, really well for the first 25, 30 years. Because in the first 25, 30 years, everything is brand new. Think about, think about buying a brand new car or think about moving into a brand new house, right? If you've ever experienced the idea of buying a brand new car, I think is a good way to think about this. Assuming you drive it off the lot and you get to 5,000 miles and nothing's gone bad, that car is going to drive 100,000, 120,000 miles, and you're not going to have any problems at all, right? Maybe a little bit of changing the oil, a little bit of maintenance here and there, but this thing's going to be great. But all of us have at one point purchased the lemon, right, or bought the car that was 120,000, 150,000, 200,000. I drove one of my cars to 310,000 miles, right? At that point, you're using like baler twine and duct tape to keep the thing running, right? We understand like how that works. The same thing goes for a city. When we have this expansion after World War II, everything is brand new. The parks are brand new. The schools are brand new. The homes are brand new. The roads, the sidewalks, everything is brand new. All of a sudden, we get out a generation, and all that stuff is old. All of it needs to be fixed. All of it needs to be maintained. We don't have the tax base to do that. But we do have the capacity to grow more, right? We do have the capacity to add more and more. Um, and so we did. That's what we tried to do. That's what we worked on. And in the U.S., we had uh, a lot of uh, things that we did to try to juice growth even more. And we wound up, this is someone said to me tonight, oh, uh, cool old cars. And I'm like, yeah, that's actually gas lines, right? Um, I was born in 73, so I don't remember the gas lines. They are legend to me. Um, but uh, this is supposed to be a picture of the gas lines. When we got into the 1970s, and had uh, a, 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 an oil crisis around the world, um, we also experienced for the first time the slowing down of the suburban expansion market, the slowing down of the housing market. And this caused us to do some fairly radical things. Um, one of the things that we did in the United States is we uh, began to create a secondary market for mortgages. Back in the Great Depression, um, we created an, an, an organization called Fannie Mae. Um, Fannie Mae was a government-sponsored uh, entity. It was government-run, government control. The Federal Housing Administration ran it. And its goal or its mission was to buy mortgages from banks and then hold them. And the idea was if we can take a bank, a local bank that issues a mortgage, uh, buy that mortgage from them, uh, that we could then get that local bank to write another mortgage and another mortgage and another mortgage. And if your goal is to have a lot of mortgages written and have a lot of homes built and have a lot of money flowing through the system, remember, create a lot of growth, a lot of expansion, uh, Fannie Mae did a really great job of making that happen. They created a lot of what economists would call liquidity in the market, right? They generated a lot of transactions. By the time we get to the end of the 1960s, um, we looked at Fannie Mae and we said, we think you can do even more if you're unshackled. And so we privatized it. Um, we actually kind of got the federal government out of it, loosened the reins uh, and said, uh, instead of only making loans to um, what is called qualified mortgages or very like ultra conservative, uh, we could also put slash racist into that conversation. Uh, mortgages, kind of an exclusive group of places you were writing mortgages for. Uh, we want you to expand your portfolio and make lots and lots of loans to lots and lots of places, buy lots of mortgages. And so uh, Fannie Mae was privatized. Around the same time, 
Freddie Mac was created. Essentially, when we privatize things, we have now two players in the market. So there's two entities kind of doing the same thing, both uh, quasi-government backed, but uh, private sector. Um, in the 70s, then, we created this alternate organization called Ginny May. And the idea of Ginny May uh, was that they were going to buy the old qualified mortgages, but they were going to do something really, really special with them. Uh, they were not going to hold them on their books. They were going to bundle them uh, and then do something called securitize them. They were going to take uh, your mortgage, your mortgage, your mortgage, your mortgage, your mortgage, your mortgage. They were going to buy them all, and then they were going to take them and put them all into one thing and sell a little bit of that thing to you and a little bit of that thing to you and a little bit of that thing to you in a, in a bundle that would look more like a stock than anything else, right? It's called securitization. And the government started the securitization process with Ginnie Mae, uh, doing fairly conservative kind of loans. Um, the idea here, though, and this is important with the 1970s uh, thing, is that when we got to the 1970s and we had the period of inflation, just like is happening right now, when inflation goes up, what happens to interest rates? In, in a functioning market, interest rates go up as well. Um, the reason for that is obvious. If my money, let's say inflation goes to 10%. If my money is going to lose 10% value every year and I'm going to loan you money for a year and ask to have it back after a year, I need you to pay me at least 10% interest or I'm just going to lose money, right? So when inflation goes up, interest rates go up. Okay. I haven't quite figured out how to explain this easily yet. So stick with me here because I think I can, I'll, I'll try. I don't have an easy slide for this. I need to come up with one. If you are a local bank, remember I told you that they only wrote five-year loans with a balloon on the end because they couldn't take long-term interest rate risk? Okay, the 1970s was the reason, it was like a case study of bad long-term risk, right? So you're a local bank. You're writing these loans. The federal government's created a market now for 20-year, 30-year mortgages. You own 30-year mortgages now. The federal government has said, we got your back. Don't worry. We got your back. No problem. If you get in a bad thing, we'll buy that loan from you. As long as it's a qualified mortgage, we'll buy that loan from you. So you have a portfolio full of qualified mortgages. Those mortgages, let's say, are paying 5%. Now, interest rates go to 10% because inflation goes to 10%. So interest rates go way up. You have a bunch of mortgages paying 5%. You're another bank. You, have, you can do two things. You can buy their mortgages that pay 5%, or you can go make a new mortgage to a new person at 10%. What, what are you going to do? You want the new mortgage at 10%, right? Okay, let's say that these people have to sell their 5% mortgages. How much are you going to pay? You're not going to pay a dollar on a dollar. You're going to ask for a discount. And so all of a sudden, all these local banks had long-term interest rate risk, and they were insolvent. They didn't have the money. And they were losing money every time that they sold a mortgage or every time that they had to, in a sense, evaluate their portfolio. Ginny May was created to be, and I wrote this in the book, and the, the editor's like, you can't say that. And I'm like, yeah, I just did. They were, uh, they were created to be the dumb money at the card table. You... Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you're free market players now. You're private sector. You're not a, a government entity. You can't lose money because you got, you know, shareholders and stockholders and all that. So if you're going to sell your mortgage that's a low interest rate, you're going to have to do it at a discount. But Ginny Mae will buy it and pay full value. And so Ginny Mae was created to lubricate the market, to keep things flowing, to keep things moving. One um, really important thing that happened with the creation of Ginny Mae that is like parallel to this story, but is really like a, a ticking time bomb kind of set at the middle of the financial system. Um, along with this legislation, uh, the federal government wrote into law that the uh, debt of Ginny Mae, these mortgage-backed securities that they were creating uh, and issuing out, um, that they were selling uh, could be used as the highest form of collateral for banks. So the highest form of collateral would be a treasury bill. 
um, you could decide to use a mortgage-backed security instead of a treasury bill. And let me just give you a little bit of banking 101. Um, a mortgage-backed security is going to pay a slightly higher interest rate than a treasury bill. If the federal government says you can hold those as reserves, you're, you're great, it's just the same as like AAA, the same as a treasury bill, banks all of a sudden started buying lots and lots and lots of these mortgage-backed securities. They needed more and more and more for their reserves. And so a very predictable thing happened. This is a chart called the Case-Shiller Index. I'm going to show you now. I, I put here from the end of World War II up until the end of the 1980s. Um, and I want to show you what has happened. The Case-Shiller Index is an index of home prices. Uh, you have the end of the war, and you have this period of kind of uh, ramping up uh, to the full kind of suburbanization project. And it really kicks in here in the early 1950s. And you see that over time, prices actually start to go down, go down, 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 as we develop these kind of efficiencies in the marketplace of producing suburban homes over and over and over. You can think of this the way that computer prices and TV prices have gone down over time as the technology has gotten better. That, that's what was going on in the first generation of this suburban home building. We started to figure out, oops, I hit the wrong button. We started to figure out what we were doing, and it got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And then we hit the financial hiccups, right? This is that first bout of inflation uh, where banks started to lose money. They stopped lending, and prices went way, way down because there was no market for buying. Uh, then you have the 1970s inflation bubble where the government stepped in, said, all right, we're going to bail out these banks. We'll create Ginny Mae. We'll take the mortgages off your balance sheet, and we want to get you out lending more and more. In fact, lend, lend, lend lend, lend. And we saw prices skyrocket. We saw things go way up until there was a big increase in interest rates in the early 80s that sent them back down. Then we had in the U.S., and I looked, and you did not have this, so this is a part of the U.S. story that is different. Um, we had this thing called the SNL crisis. We could do an hour on the SNL crisis. It's actually fascinating. Basically, banks, we did this big deregulation thing at the beginning of the 80s, and banks had a huge incentive, savings and loans, thrifts, had this massive incentive uh, to uh, lend money out in real estate, build up their portfolio. Even if their portfolio was insolvent, they had ways of acquiring other SNLs that valued their portfolio in like really janky kind of ways and ended up uh, really inflating the housing market until the fraud collapsed on itself, basically. So you have this SNL bubble in the 1980s. I, I put this in here because I want you to see that in relationship to history, that 1970s inflationary bubble was really, really dislocating. Um, it was very big. Th these were prices significantly above what people had been used to seeing and what they experienced. The pace of going up was very disorienting. Um, this was a huge kind of financially created bubble. The SNL bubble then was even bigger, and it caused even more distress and more shock in the system. In fact, when the SNL bubble worked itself out, we had an election shortly after that. If you remember, Bill Clinton beat George, w, George Bush, the first George Bush, and at that time, the whole thing was, it's the economy, stupid. Jobs, 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 grow, grow, grow. As part of that 90s getting our mojo back, uh, we had this, uh, this partnership that was created between government and the private sector to get more people into homes. Um, we talk a lot today about public-private partnerships. This would be at the federal level, and I think you could call it the regulators and the regulated if you were cynical, or you could just call it like a happy kumbaya moment where uh, banks and insurance companies got together with uh, regulators to talk about how do we get more people into homes. And as part of doing this, they said, we're going to significantly lower down payments. In fact, we're going to make, in some instances, down payments zero, right? By, again, providing insurance and all these other things to kind of hedge our bets. Uh, we are going to switch from having banks, uh, how do I say this, do banking, <laughs> I'm going to loan you money. I want to get to know you. What's your financial situation? I said, no, 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 that, that's not good. Um, we're going to have something called a credit score. And the credit score will be uh, 
non-discriminatory. It will be this honest assessment of where you're at. Um, we'll be able to do that at, at larger scale, so with less friction, and we can lower the administrative cost for issuing loans and issue way, way, way more loans. Um, we're going to increase the use of mortgage insurance. So sure, this is all going to create a lot of risk in the system, but if we have broad portfolios, we can hedge that risk and insure it, and we'll just rely on insurance companies, such as AIG and others, uh, to provide that insurance. And then the securitization, this idea that, um, sure, if I own your mortgage, it's very risky. If I own your mortgage, it's very risky. But if I own a bundle of all of your mortgages, and I own just a slice of that, you know, it'll work out. Like, you might default, you might default, but the broad group of people is not going to default. That's not what happened, right? So this is that same chart, but expanded out a little bit longer. This is to the end of 2007. Yeah. And this was, of course, the, the subprime bubble. Because as we all kind of understand, right, if you let people buy houses with no down payment, uh, with no credit history, um, with no, you know, sense of like you have to pay it back, if we allow insurance companies to write insurance policies based on historical default rates, you know, the default rate back here, uh, it, like literally, um, you've heard of the insurance company AIG, they were writing policies against uh, mortgage default. Their models went back to like this period of time and they're like, look, nobody defaults. And it's like, yeah, but you're sitting way up here today uh, at a place that doesn't make sense. Um, we had the, the subprime bubble and then the housing crisis in 2008. The fascinating thing, and I'm gonna show you some uh, Canadian charts here, is that you didn't experience this the way we did. You, you're, you're kind of right here in this time frame. Um, it's very interesting to understand why. Uh, my assessment of why might be different than yours, but when I look at it, um, you were late to the financialization game. Um, you also, in the past, required higher down payments. You have a more centralized system, but the centralized part of your system is cons is was conservative in the way that America's, the, the U.S. was conservative in the 50s and 60s, right? In the 50s and 60s, our mortgage system was very, very conservative. Very, when I say conservative, I'm not talking politics. I'm talking risk aversion. Your system was very risk averse in this period of time when uh, the U.S. had a big bubble. That, that has changed, right? So... The reaction to the subprime housing crisis, what, what, what happened, what do you think happened when prices collapsed in terms of new homes being built? That, that right there. This is a chart of uh, housing starts. So how many homes are we building every year? 1960s, 70s, 80s. That is the peak in 2007. Bam, we stopped building homes. And we stopped building homes for a long time. In fact, it was a very, very slow, slow ramp up. And we're not even back to where we were in the early 2000s. Um, the interesting thing to note about this is that there's a generation of Americans, and, and you have this too, we have this around the world, born after World War II. We call them the baby boomers, right? The baby boomers have an echo the echo of the baby boomers is not my generation. I'm in that generation X, right? I'm born in 1973. Um, the echo of the baby boom is the millennial generation. And the fascinating thing about the millennial generation is that they were all graduating from college or they were starting to graduate from college and enter that prime home building age at the same exact time that we stopped building houses. And so we have had a decade or more of very limited housing construction at the same time that a huge generation of people, baby boom generation, huge. Generation X, much, much smaller. Millennials, huge. This huge generation entered their prime home buying years at the time when we had stopped building houses almost completely. When you restrict supply and you increase demand, what happens to price? It goes way, way up, right? But there's another thing. Uh, you may not know this, but after 2008, we arrested a bunch of bankers 
We reformed the banking system. We took out all the crazy... No, we didn't do any of that. Um, (laughs) What did we do after 2008? Um, We said, oh my gosh, housing is at the center of our financial system. Every bank has mortgage-backed securities as reserves. If those go down, every bank is going to default. I I don't know if you recall this, but there's a famous scene in 2000. Uh, 2008, when Hank Paulson, who's a former chairman of Goldman Sachs, who was our treasury secretary at the time, uh, Republican, went to Nancy Pelosi, the Democrat Speaker of the House, got down on one knee and begged her to pass uh, the $800 billion uh, bailout bill for the banks. Um, The quote at the time was, if we don't do this, uh, there will be no money in the ATMs in 48 hours. And again, I had my publisher say, why? And I'm like, because every bank would be insolvent. That's why. There'd be no cash anywhere. Um, If we didn't bail out the banks, if we didn't buy the mortgages that they were holding, those mortgages were going down, down, down. Um, They would have all defaulted. And so what we did, and we did this, uh, you all, to an extent, began to copy us. Uh, we poured all kinds of money into, again, what we did with Ginny May, which is let's take the bad mortgages off your books and let's get you lending again. Go out and lend. Okay. Can you lend to young people? Not very easily. Who can you lend to in the post-2008 market? You can lend to lots of people who already have money. And so what we saw, I'm going to cough, What we saw was a a huge shift in how we were doing housing. Um, My colleague Daniel has described this as a trickle or a fire hose. Neighborhoods were able to get either lots and lots and lots of capital for massive redevelopment, big, big projects that would be done, millions of dollars, mind-blowing amounts of money, or they would be completely starved of capital. This is why you get this kind of insane thing that we see here in Medicine Hat, which we, by the way, we see everywhere, but you see it here too, and it's, it's disorienting everywhere you go. Where we have, house, we, we have a housing shortage here. We have a housing crisis. Prices are way too high. We have people who don't have housing. We have people who need housing. Yet you have houses that are boarded up, unoccupied, unused. And you have millions of dollars being put into new housing that really doesn't fit your demographic here at all. This is this very strange thing because the market is no longer responding to local supply and demand. The market is responding to the macro financial incentives. If I can create a mortgage and that mortgage can be sold on a secondary market and traded, that is a good project, regardless of if there's local demand or not. And so you get neighborhoods like this. Uh, This was... uh, uh, a colleague of mine's neighborhood in Sarasota, Florida. Um, Abandoned single-family home, abandoned single-family home, and then, you know, multi-story tower next to it. That's the fire hose. Out on the edge of town, then, you get the, uh, you know, the properties um, go in, and in one fell swoop, we're going to develop the whole thing. All the pipe, all the utilities, everything. And then fill in the homes later. Again, this is what fire hose looks like. I, I visited some of your fire hose places out on the edge, and they are a sharp, sharp contrast to the decline that we see kind of widespread in places where there shouldn't be decline. Let me show you the last chart then, because um, we have this story that we understand, and when we look at that subprime crisis, e- even the economists call it a housing bubble, right? This is a bubble, this is a bubble, but we call this the housing bubble, right? The subprime bubble. It's fascinating then to hear those same economists call this the housing recovery. Because that's where we're at. At the, at the end of last year, that's where we were, right there. It's, it's basically uh, stayed about right there since then. How do you recover to a bubble? Right? 
What does that even mean? Housing prices no longer respond to local supply and demand dynamics. There's tons and tons of demand for homes in this community at a certain price point. The market is incapable of fulfilling that because the market is responding to the macro financial incentives. You think when you buy a home that you are purchasing a home and that the transaction is you buying a home. The transaction is you creating a mortgage that someone else buys and turns into a financial product. You know how when you go on Gmail and you're not paying for Gmail and you have that realization or Facebook or whatever and you have that realization that you are the product you think you're the consumer, but you're actually like, you realize like, I am the product. When you buy a house, you're kind of the consumer, but not really. You are the product. And the product that you're generating is a piece of mortgage paper that creates this daisy chain of financial instruments that are essential for our financial system to operate. And the one thing about our financial system is that it always wants to go up. Here's your stuff. So uh, in this case, the blue is the Case-Shiller Index that I was showing you before. It's a 20-city one, but it kind of emulates that. Uh, this is 2000 to 2014. So there's the, uh, the housing crisis. Because of the way this chart is drawn, it doesn't look like as high a spike as this one. But basically, the blue is the run up here. This is that right there. You can see that you did have a run-up in the early 2000s. You did not have the crash that we had. You also weren't as high as we were. But you have kept going up and up and up in the years since because, again, you used to be very financially conservative the way we were conservative in the 50s and 60s. You now have, in a full sense, embraced all the financial alchemy that we have embraced very low down payments, subsidized down payments, lower mortgage interest rates, secondary markets, securitization, all of that. Um, here's where you're at today. So this goes back to the 70s, 2020. You see that you, you really didn't have, I mean, this is your housing crisis, smaller run-up. We were about right here, smaller run-up, less down, but now you've, you've caught us. So we are, in a sense, in the same place. I want you to take this one home with you tonight because this, to me, is the central conundrum of where we're at. Because we have these two conversations, right? We have a housing as an investment conversation. We have a housing as shelter conversation. And all of us broadly want to be able to afford to live in a home, right? I mean, that's like a prerequisite, right? I want to have a home I can afford. But once we're in a home the affordability dynamic, we become less sensitive to it, right? So I sat down and wrote one day, who are all the people and organizations and entities that benefit from high house prices? And the list is long, right? If you're, an exist, if you're a local government, you benefit from high housing prices. When prices go up every year, your tax base goes up every year, you collect more taxes. Even if you don't raise taxes, you collect more taxes. It's like this beautiful thing that happens. Finance people love it. State governments, federal governments, the providence in your case, like when taxes, when property values go up, taxes go up, it's all good, right? Existing homeowners, and I always have someone in the audience who's like, well, I don't want housing prices to go up, and I say to them, okay. I believe you, like that's what's in your heart. But if you go back to this chart here, and I told you in the next five years, um, housing can do one of two things. Housing can either correct to a market rate or normal price, in which case your house will be worth 60% of what it is, or 40%, 50% of what it is today. So let's say cut in half. Or five years from now, your house can be worth double what it's worth today. It keeps going up. Which would you prefer? Five years from now, your house doubling in value or your house being cut in half? And nobody wants their house value cut in half, right? It's just not. People will say, well, I can live where I'm at now. I don't have to have it go up anymore. That's not how these systems work. They go up, they go down. They're not going to hang out in the same range. Banks, 
insurance companies. Uh, obviously, we talked about mortgages being at the center of the banking system, right? Um, banks can't have home prices go down. They have to go up. Developers. It's fascinating to me. I said this to a room of developers, and I thought they were going to get mad at me, and instead they applauded. So I'm going to say it to you, and you can get mad at me, but understand the developers didn't. I said developers benefit from high housing prices, and here's what I said that I thought they would boo. There are a lot of incompetent developers that would have been long driven out of business if housing prices were not going up. An incompetent developer can make a bunch of mistakes and be bailed out by price appreciation. When you sit down and do your pro forma, here's the price I need, I'll work out. I get to the end, uh, it didn't work out, but guess what? Housing prices are 25% higher, so it bails me out. Um, land speculators, realtors, pension funds, all these benefit from housing prices being elevated. And many of them are hurt when housing prices go down. So who doesn't benefit? Um, and these are two different categories, uh, renters. Particularly, there's a lot of millennial renters who get mad when I put them together with the poor because they're like, I'm not poor. I'm like, I get it, but you're, you're housing poor. You're not, you don't have this asset of a house because you are of that age when we stop building houses. Um, renters, people who would like houses, and poor people. Where is the power in our system to change the macroeconomic forces that affect housing prices? Does it reside here or does it reside here? <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, so I'm going to read this one because I don't remember precisely what it says, but supporting it, the word's right. If we think about the goal... We've put this into two questions. Question one, how do we create affordable housing in our community? Question two, how do we make housing affordable in our community? Those two questions sound the same. They're not the same. They're very, very, very different. What I'm here to tell you tonight is that question number two, we are in a sense powerless to do. The ship that we are on is being rocked in wavy waters by a macroeconomic system that we have very little control over. We have a little bit of control, but we have very little control over. Question number one, we can actually do. And if we can focus on the difference between the two, one, that question number one is, how do we go out and create more housing that is at an affordable level? We can do that, we can do it at scale, we can do it aggressively, and we can make a huge, huge difference doing it. If the, if the question we focus on is number two, how do we make housing go down in price and become more affordable? We will wind up doing crazy things like subsidizing down payments, subsidizing mortgages, uh, subsidizing developers to build more units, and all of those things have the perverse effect of actually making prices go up. So I'm going to spend the last little bit of time here talking about some very specific things that we can do to answer that first question. How do we create more affordable housing in our community? I showed this to you last time, and I'm going to go at it again because it, it is the most important strategy that we can do. We have to allow our neighborhoods to uh, thicken up again. We have to allow our neighborhoods to grow incrementally like they used to 100 years ago when housing was abundant and cheap. We don't have to do it in a way that's low quality, but we do have to do it in a way that is dynamic. When I say allow the next increment by right, what I'm saying is that every neighborhood should be allowed to add units to it and that the regulatory process for doing that should be as minimal as possible, as minimal as possible. In concert with this, I always, always, always state this conjoined statement. No neighborhood should experience radical change. I showed you that neighborhood of the single family homes boarded up in the huge tower. No neighbor should, should experience that. That should not be the option that anyone is subjected to. But no neighborhood can be exempt from change. No neighborhood can be put under glass, locked in amber, 
not allowed to, to, to evolve or change in any way. In fact, we have to aggressively embrace a low level of change throughout all of our communities. We have to do this by fundamentally lowering the bar of entry. I, I, I've used this analogy, and I was going to put this in a slide, and then I'm like, nah, I'll just, I'll skip it. And now I'm here, and I'm like, I wish I had. So let me give you this analogy. Remember I talked about the trickle in the fire hose a little bit ago? We've created a housing market, and I'm going to give you an analogy to a shoe market, right? Let's pretend that our shoe market, um, we create two types of shoes. We create high-end, like, Gucci sandals. I don't even wear those, so I don't even know what it would be. Like, a high-end, $1,000, like, high-end shoes. And then we create uh, very high-end tennis shoes, like a like Air Jordans or like whatever the real high-end tennis shoes. And that's what our market creates. We create those two products. We've found ways to finance them, ways to build them, ways to create those shoes over and over and over again. And the idea is that if we have people who can't afford Gucci shoes or Air Jordans, that what happens is that they buy used sandals and used Air Jordans when the people who originally bought them, when they wear out a little bit and they move up or buy other ones. Essentially, our market for housing today is very much like that. And what we say is that if we want to create more um, affordable units, what we will do is create a lot more Gucci sandals, a lot more Air Jordans. We'll just build a ton of them, and then it will filter down to people who want to buy them at this level because the person who's got the one-year-old Air Jordans will buy the new Air Jordans and sell the one-year-old to someone else, and eventually everybody will be able to get in shoes they can afford. That's insane, right? And we recognize that if that was the shoe market we had, what we have is a huge um, entry point for someone who wants to just make penny loafers, right? Someone who wants to make an affordable shoe. There's a massive, massive market for that. In the housing market, what there is is there's a massive market for penny loafers. There's a massive unmet market for very, very affordable units. And the thing is, is that we as a community can align systems so that we get a lot more of those. That's what I mean when I say lower the bar of entry. So let's talk about what that, what that looks like. Um, <laughs> again, I've got my publisher on my mind. The publisher's like, you shouldn't use an elderly woman as this example. You should use a young person. And I'm like, no, I think you're wrong. Um, there are a lot of people in Medicine Hat, there are a lot of people uh, across uh, all of North America who own more home than they can make use of. And not only do they own more home than they can make use of, they own more home than they can take care of. I talked about that baby boom, that big baby boom generation. Uh, a lot of them right now are stuck in suburban homes that have lived through that useful life and now need a lot of ongoing maintenance, a lot of repairs. They need a new roof. They need new appliances. They need new this, new that, right? They, they've reached that point where they need a lot of love. They also just have high burn rates to begin with, big yards, big driveways. We got to shovel snow, plow snow, a lot of expenses, in many of these places, they'll have three, four bedrooms, and they'll be using one, right? And I use the avatar of, like, the widowed uh, woman who uh, is on a fixed income, um, who wants to stay in the house, wants to stay in the neighborhood, has friends in the neighborhood, goes to church up the street, all that stuff, doesn't want to move, but can't afford to stay. Why don't we allow this person to take one of their extra bedrooms put a fire break in it, bring in a little kitchenette, convert it into an accessory apartment, put an exterior door on it, and rent it out. Why wouldn't we allow them to do that? That would not only give them uh, the ability to turn an asset that is non-producing into something that creates cash flow for them, give them a little bit more income, allow them to pay their rent, to fix the roof, to stay in the neighborhood, to keep things nice but we give them someone else living in proximity to them. And I realize that that's not always like a panacea, but I know a lot of 
of elderly people. I, I know a lot of young people that would love a helping hand around at times. We can't do this today because it's illegal. Our zoning codes don't allow it. Our building codes make it overly restrictive. Our, our processes for doing this are really, really cumbersome and difficult. Yet this is a very natural thing to do. And it takes this asset we have that we're not making any use of as a community, all these empty bedrooms that are really a burden on people, and turns it into something that creates a very low price, affordable housing unit. A lot of people call these accessory dwelling units, and I think if you go to City Hall, you might see an accessory dwelling unit code. Um, I would never write an accessory dwelling unit code because that sounds like something I don't want to have next to me, um, but I would love to have a backyard cottage next to me. Sometimes we're horrible at marketing, right? Road diet, like, ugh, who wants a diet? Huh, who wants a beautiful street? I do. Um, Backyard cottages are amazing because, again, uh, we think of the use case. The most predominant use case that we see is uh, the family member who no longer is living alone needs to live in proximity to someone, generally an elderly family member, who we don't want to put in uh, some type of isolation or some type of home. Uh, we would like them to be able to live quasi-independently near us and so we put in a backyard cottage and allow them to move in. They can sell their house. They can cash out that equity. They can use it to pay for the cottage. They can maybe support the family's expenses a little bit. They can be there to help raise kids, be there when kids get home from school, help working age parents. There is a, 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 a thousand good reasons why this should happen. But there's a couple of reasons why it, it won't, right? And they generally have to do with regulations and cultural acceptance of this thickening up of our neighborhoods. And that's maybe part of it. In California, I feel like we can get over that one though. In California, um, they actually passed a statewide law in the 70s that said you can build uh, accessory dwelling units anywhere, um, but cities can regulate it. Cities regulated them out of existence. And so a couple of years ago, they passed a law that said cities can no longer regulate them. If you can meet these requirements, you can put them on any lot. Um, ADUs did not take off then in California, backyard cottages, um, until they figured out the financing part, which is about right here. In California today, um, the, here's the number that they've built in, in the last, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, what happened is that they figured out the financing part of it. Uh, you can now buy an accessory dwelling unit. You can go buy a backyard cottage um, the same way you would a car. Basically like an impulse buy now. You can wake up in the morning and be like, I would love a backyard cottage. You can go to the backyard cottage place, sign the papers. Uh, they show up and in 60 days, they'll put in all the plumbing, they'll put in the foundation, they'll bring it out, they'll drop it in and you'll have an accessory unit in your backyard. Very, very simple, very, very easy. Guess what? No chaos and mayhem has ensued. Uh, what has happened is that a whole bunch of very low-priced units are now available in the marketplace. This is a starter home. It's not a tiny home. It's not something we fetish. It's not something we build clusters of. Uh, this is really just the basic unit of construction. Um, if we look back at the city of Medicine Hat, we can go through your historic neighborhoods, and if you look close, you will see starter homes everywhere. They're no longer starter homes for the most part. There might be some 600 square foot homes that still exist, um, but for the most part, what happened is that you became affluent. People started with a very small home and then they added onto it and added onto it and added onto it and now it's a 1,000 foot, 1,500 feet, 2,000 foot home with a 600 foot starter home there in the middle that was the original house. When we prohibit these, when we make them difficult to build, when we have a really high bar of entry into this, what we do is we take a whole segment of our market and say, you don't get to participate. If we went to uh, young millennials uh, in 2008 and said, you can rent for the next 10 years, 600, 800 square foot apartment, or you can build a 600 square foot house and add on to it over time, it's the same living space, it's the same amount of unit space, but one empowers someone, makes them vested in the community, gives them something, and the other one just makes them, in a sense, a, a ward of the state and the financial system. We have a 
bigness bias in the way we do permitting, the way we do financing. Um, and I, I love this city. I think this city has done a lot of things uh, and has some really good plans to make uh, housing permitting a lot easier through City Hall. Um, but we still have this kind of built-in bias. If you look at uh, the cost for doing a large project, they are much bigger than the cost for doing a small project, right? And, and I think that that is obvious. And when we sit at City Hall and we process permits, we're like, we are putting this big developer through a lot more work than the small developer. But that changes when we get to the per unit cost. On a per unit cost, we put people trying to do very small, very simple things through a ridiculous amount of red tape and regulation. That's not a swat at your bureaucracy. It's not a swat at your staff. I think they're very good people, but that is, a, that is a reality. If we want these things to be done at scale, if we want these things to be done in mass, we have to make it very, very, very easy for normal, regular people to do. Um, and this gets me to the idea of finance. Um, if you remember when we talked about the Great Depression, I said mortgages were short term, uh, they were interest only, there was a, a bunch of things about them that made them kind of volatile when we hit the Great Depression. Uh, the thing that the federal government did to arrest that decline was they stepped in and said, we will insure that mortgage, um, we will provide a sense backing to give the banks confidence to be able to make those loans. I'm going to give you a magic thing today. Um, there's nothing that stops us from doing that again. A lot of the, 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 the type of financial instruments that would be required to build this or build this or build this are not real attractive to local banks. And when we look at this per unit cost, a lot of that is the financing cost. The financing costs are very high on a per unit basis when you're building these small units. Guess who can countermand that? The city can countermand that. Private philanthropy can countermand that. I see cities all the time that get money for affordable housing. And what do they do? They go out and they subsidize developers to build housing. They subsidize down payments. They, they basically spend money making housing more expensive. What if we just said, bank, make this loan to this person who wants to build the starter house. And if you're worried about it, we will insure it so you won't lose money. What's the cost to the public? Potentially nothing, most likely nothing, right? Most likely nothing. Worst case scenario, we might have to spend a little bit of money while that thing goes through a foreclosure. But again, I think we do some due diligence in our neighborhoods, that's not as likely. What is the likelihood that we are gonna lose money building subdivisions out on the edge? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. We can make some really good, low-cost, low-risk investments in building this kind of housing in our community. We can do it in abundance. We can do it over and over and over and over again. Uh, and we can do it at essentially no cost or very, very, very low cost to taxpayers. The last thing I want to share with you is about uh, just the development community itself. Um, Who's going to build these accessory apartment units? Who's going to build these backyard cottages? Who, who is going to build the starter homes? Not the developers that we have working out on the edge today building the big suburban houses. Not the developers we have building the big apartment buildings and all that. It's, it's not their jam. It's not what they do. The city of South Bend, Indiana, is a great model for this because they recognized that the kind of housing that they needed built was not the kind that their developers were set up to deliver. But they had lots and lots of entrepreneurial people in the community that wanted to step up and do it. And so what they did is they created uh, uh, training sessions for these developers. They created a network of developers. They brought in the Incremental Development Alliance. They trained a bunch of people who were like, I'm interested in being a developer. And not the kind of developer that goes out and builds 100 homes, but the kind that buys the single family home across the street that's in disrepair and turns it into a duplex. How does that person do a pro forma? How do they hire subcontractors? How do they uh, get a construction loan? They go through and like help them figure all that out. 
and they create cohorts of these people. It's amazing. Uh, we've been there and we've seen it. We did a, a video recently on the stuff they're doing in South Bend. It's absolutely astounding. They have taken people who were on the sidelines and put them to work building their own neighborhoods up. These are pe people deeply, deeply vested in their place. And the kind of work they're doing uh, was unthinkable a decade ago and now is very, very common throughout the entire city. I said that was the last thing. I'm going to give you one more. Um, <laughs> in Florida, and this comes from South Bend too, but we started to see this pop up in other places. Um, cities uh, that have, remember I said housing used to be cheap, abundant, and very low quality. We wanted a lot of cheap housing. We want it to be abundant, abundant and cheap, but we don't want the low quality. Um, what they've started to do is go in and in this kind of middle range housing, the duplexes, the triplexes, the stuff that's not getting built, they've actually created pre-approved building plans. A big part of the regulatory process is going through and reviewing your plans, making sure that they meet all the specs and all the requirements before you go out and build. Um, what South Bend did, uh, what communities in Florida we've seen now do, is they actually create a booklet of pre-approved plans. So if you want to build a duplex, you want to build a triplex, you want to build, they've got different sizes, different widths, different configurations. You just go through the book, pick that one out. It's pre-approved. You don't have to pay the building permit review fee. You don't have to spend, you know, weeks while someone looks over it, gets back to you with red lines and all that. You pick it up, you go out and you start building. Very, very, very affordable. I want to end by talking a little bit more about Medicine Hat. And I want to show you a couple things. Um, I'm going to preface this by saying it is all, when I go talk to places, I always show them examples from other places because as soon as you start showing them examples from their own place, they start freaking out. And they're like, they have a story for everything. And like, well, that's not right. Da, 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 da. I've got a couple slides here I want to show you. I'm just taking you on a little journey. Follow with me. Um, since the beginning of the year, we've been talking about the financial constraints, the financial difficulties that our development pattern places on our cities. And I showed you some maps early on uh, that kind of showed how the core downtown, the surrounding neighborhoods, the pre-depression pattern of development is really, really financially productive. It is the most successful part of any city, including yours. Um, we found an instance where there's three houses next to each other uh, in, in one of your core neighborhoods. And as part of this housing conversation and how neighborhoods evolve over time, I want you to show you some of the potency that we see in these places. So this is uh, on 2nd Street Southeast. It's a nice little single family home. It has a total pr productivity, financial productivity of $1.5 million an acre, right? Which if we went out to the edge of town and we looked at some of the new homes that you've been building, some of the homes that are very, very expensive, they take up a lot of land they would be a fraction of that productivity. So this is a very, very productive home, right? But when we get into, and Ed, tell me how many units are in this one? Two? Do you remember? I think this is a duplex. It's a slightly, it's the same size lot. All these lots we're going to show you are the same size. So these homes would fit, in a sense, interchangeably on the lots. Um, this one was 1.5 million. This one's 3.9 million. Just right up the street, same street, same place. Um, here's a mixed-use building, uh, a number of units in here, also a little bit of commercial. Um, now you're talking 7.5 million. So 1.5, 3.9, this is, 7.5. This is how we, by thickening up our neighborhoods, by adding units, by continuing to grow and expand incrementally, not making a large leap, not a radical change, but every neighborhood evolves and every neighborhood changes. This is how we add lots and lots and lots of affordable units without crashing our market. And it's also how we as a community become wealthy. It's how we build wealth. It's how we get the resources to maintain that road we want fixed, maintain that pipe we need fixed, fix up that park, maintain this gorgeous building. The wealth for doing that has to be generated within our neighborhoods. And by allowing our neighborhoods to evolve, so over a generation, over a, a, a number of decades, a house like this can evolve to be a house like this. 
and a place like this can evolve to be a place of this intensity, what we are doing is we are taking our existing investments and growing their value and their worth. We are growing our community's wealth. We are becoming richer. And I know the end game here is not to die the richest city. I'm, I'm with you on that. But if the end game is to provide a lot of good housing options for people, while at the same time being able to invest in and maintain a very nice place, this is the strategy that gets us there. We had this obsession in the 20th century with will it scale? The idea that uh, could we build something and then generate enough efficiencies where this would really, really scale out. Think big apartment building, big skyscraper, big thing, big residential subdivision. Our obsession was always, will it scale? Can we do this really efficiently? We have to abandon that mindset. And we actually have to ask ourselves, uh, will it replicate? The accessory apartment, the backyard cottage, the, 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 the small starter house, these are not things that scale in an efficiency sense. Each one is like an inefficient transaction. But what they do is they can replicate over and over and over. We can do this everywhere. We can accomplish this over and over and over again. Um, as an end thought here, I want to talk just a little bit about Medicine Hat. I said at the beginning how much I admire your mayor, your city council, uh, your city staff. I really sincerely mean that. Um, we work with communities all over North America, and I don't know how many times we've said, <laughs> if, if, if we could just drop in the Medicine Hat staff here uh, to your uh, cluster mess of a problem, uh, wow, they would do really great. Um, I feel like one of the challenges that you have here is that you've not been growing in terms of population, and so you kind of have like a Maserati engine that just sits on idle in many ways. Um, I also recognize and understand that you all live in this community and it's hard for you to look at yourselves in uh, the positive light that I'm sharing with you. But let me just say that to me, I judge a really good staff on their ability and their capacity and their willingness to question themselves, question their own approaches, to think deeply about the way things have always been done, to be open to critique and criticism, to be willing to try new things, and I have seen all of this in your staff in abundance. And to me, it's very heroic in many ways. Um, not without fault, uh, not without critique. Um, we've been working for a year in what I call a high contact sport in City Hall, trying to challenge people and talk people through different ways of doing things. Um, but I have seen a lot of growth. I've seen a lot of uh, hard work and I've seen a commitment to continue to challenge ourselves. And that reflects well on, on everybody here. Um, there's been a lot of things that we're very proud of this year. Um, a lot of our work is very behind the scenes. Um, I think you will continue to see the fruits of some of this over time. Um, there's a big housing thing that is in the works right now that's coming up. I, 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 I love this story here where we went out and did uh, some of these uh, plastic little bollards. I, I came across a Facebook page that was criticizing uh, the city for putting up bollards in places, these plastic things. Um, it's very interesting because most cities want to avoid that criticism because it, it always comes. When you go out and do something that uh, is kind of like small and, and minor like this, it comes with a disproportionate amount of criticism for the gain that you get. The way most cities avoid that criticism is to A, not do anything to make the situation improved in any way. B, let a lot of time involve where you can form committees, study it, uh, come up with a design, a second design, a third design, and then agree on something kind of dumb and half-baked that you're going to do, and then go out and do a big, big project that, you know, people can comment on at a public hearing. I deeply admire places that instead of spending a million dollars doing something dumb, we'll spend uh, $500 going out and trying things and figuring out what works. To the people in this room, I would ask one thing. Give your city hall room to experiment. If they go out and do, if they go out and do the big dumb project, go ahead and criticize them all day long, right? 
But if you think about the way the private sector operates, uh, one of the things that the private sector is very good at is beta testing things. I, I referred to Gmail earlier. We've all experienced Gmail, right? Where they're like, well, you're in the beta group. We're going to try this out on you. And what Google does is it says, we're going to take 500 people and we're going to give you the new version of Gmail and let you try it out. And we're not going to as much ask you how it works. We're going to kind of watch how you use it and how it works and where things hang up and where things screw up. And then we're going to take that data and we're going to fix it. And then we're going to roll it out to 1,000 people or 10,000 people. And then we're going to fix that. And then when we get 10,000 working, we're going to roll it out to 100,000 and then we'll roll it out to everybody, right? So by the time you get Gmail, it's been vetted through this process. When cities do that, when cities start small and experiment, when they go out and do something little and it doesn't work, it looks dumb, it's it's ineffective, it seems beneath us, they get brutal, brutal criticism when what they're doing is actually prototyping cheaply to try to figure out what works. We have to give them the room to do that. If we want smart government, if we want the government to be responsive, if we want the government to like do really, really intelligent, thoughtful things, we have to give them the leeway that we give the private sector to prototype, to try things out, to screw things up, to be flexible, to be nimble. I can't do that. They can't do that in City Hall. Only you as a culture can do that. If they give you the big, dumb project, criticize them to no end. But if they're out trying little things, trying to make things work, ask them, what are you doing? What's the plan here? What are you trying to figure out? What are we trying to to, to do? They're going to have a smart answer because they're smart people. Give them that room, and they'll actually do amazing, amazing things. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, I know you got a you got a party to get to. I know you've got a after party here thing. Um, do we have like fifteen minutes? How about we take fifteen minutes? I would be happy to answer questions at the mic for like the next fifteen minutes, and then I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Last time I was here, when I got done, uh, I had to go over to this other thing. You guys are going over to the other thing tonight. I'm going to stay here. And I'll stand outside in the lobby as long as people want to ask me questions. You can record all my answers. Like, I'm cool with that. And I will stay here as long as they'll let me stay in the building and answer people's questions. But let's do like 15 minutes up here. If you have a question, there's a couple microphones up here. I'm happy to to take them to have conversation. And when we run out of 15 minutes or we run out of questions, I'm going to go stand out in the hallway out here and I'll talk to anyone one-on-one. Can, can you, do you mind? Because they're recording it. Okay. I don't, I don't, it's not on me, but I know they're recording it and they want to get your voice on the, the microphone. It's not, it's, it's not for my benefit. So, oh, no, 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 not there. Right there. You just walk by it. You're a hero. You can come up here. <laughs> um, can you, can you cue the mic over here? How about that? There we are. So great concepts by all means. Looking at a lot of the affordability, though, looking at the salaries, incomes, and whatnot here in Medicine Hat, the cost of building is still just too large. How do we bring the cost of materials, the cost of building, those things down so that something like this can launch? Yeah. Um, it's a really, really tough question. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, like, I don't know the answer. Um, I don't know how to make, like, lumber more affordable. I don't, I don't know how to make... Uh, you know, concrete more affordable, aggregate more affordable. I really don't know how to do it. Um, The thing that I would say is that the more our market is localized, the more responsive it is to local supply and demand. The more our market becomes um, internationalized or or hyper-regional, the less responsive it is to what we see here happening locally. Um, but I don't, I mean, you're getting lumber on an international market. Like, I, I, how do you make that cheaper here in Medicine Hat? Well, we used to... Sorry, you used to play in your own wood. We right? used to make bricks. Yeah, no, here. totally. I'm, and it, that's why I see so many amazing brick houses in, in other areas. Or, I'm with you, and, and I guess what I'm going to say is, if, if, if you are inspired to be the man here who makes bricks, that would be beautiful. 
I don't know how to do it, and I don't know what the market is for it. I don't know if you can make money doing it, and I don't know if you could do it for $2 a brick, but then some guy from Calgary is going to come over and say, I'll give you $3 a brick, and you're like, I got to put my kid through college, so I'm going to sell him for $3 a brick instead of $2 a brick to my neighbor. Like, I don't know how to stop that from happening. So I, I, the answer is like, I don't know. What we have done, in the name of efficiency, we have created these vast global markets, and it's it's great because you can get bricks for $2 a brick instead of $3 a brick, right? Because it can be brought in, it can be manufactured wherever and brought in, and it will undercut the person here who makes the bricks. It'll be a cheaper brick, right? And if you're building, like, I want the cheapest thing possible. But you also have this system now where we're subjected to the vagaries and the nuances of an international brick market. Take that for wood, take that for insulation, take that for every commodity. I don't really know how to fix that, overcome that. So I, I wish I had an easy answer for you, but I don't. I feel like it's, much like the financial system, I feel like it's one of the constraints we have to work with and try to overcome by being better at other things. Thank right? You. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't be a, have an have a easy, quippy answer. Please. I've lived in, uh, is this on? I've lived in several places, and I've never understood why cities won't ever revitalize an area by giving tax abatement. Like in the United States, when I lived there, they had HUD program, which I'm sure you're aware of, uh -huh. where people are able to go to different communities and buy these abandoned properties or properties that need things, and they get a tax abatement for like five years, and they have to do it. I know that there's always that chance you're going to get a developer who's going to be maybe a little underhanded and go buy a whole bunch of these properties mm -hmm. and try to get the tax abatements and fix it up and profit from doing that. Yeah. Well, why doesn't the city offer doing that where they can have people come into these places and revitalize the places? I know I lived in Regina and there were places where you could pick up a home basically for nothing. Yeah. And then you could fix up the home and you had to say, I'm going to live here for this much time. And then they did it. And then one other thing, too, I think the cities are always wrong for doing it is anytime you improve your property, whether it's that million and a half dollar your, house your or something, that is wrong. Yeah. To make it so it's the other way around, why doesn't the city look at it saying, we're going to give you, because you're going to get people working, you're going, to, yep. you're going to stimulate the market by getting people working at it, you're going to sell more things then you're not going to have all these shanties and shacks and people not doing and you're not going to have slum landlords. A slum landlord is not going to be able to say, I'm going to charge 2000 or $2,500 a month for people to live in a home and do absolutely nothing for it. They're going to be, I don't want to say punished, but they're going to be incentivized to do something with that property. And if you do something, then the property taxes go down. Yeah. Now, I know the city doesn't want to do that because they live on taxes, but there are other things to do too. But right. these are just a few of the comments well, that I had. You, you're, I think you're brilliant. Let, let's, let's use the word punish for a second. I, I will use I, it. I didn't want to use to. the word punish. No, I, I, I will use it. I um, said de-incentivize. <laughs> right. I, I think right now what happens is that if you take that rundown property and you're like, I'm going to invest, invest in it, I'm going to fix it up, and I'm going to make it nice, we punish you with more taxes. Like we create a disincentive for you to do that. The incentive is for you to take that rundown property and rent it out. You use the word slumlord. I would use the same exact word as a slumlord and basically make as minimal improvements as you can to it, as cheap as possible, it, yeah. while your taxes go down and down and down and, you know, the rents can go up and up and up. There's a, that, that is a very successful business model that is enabled by our tax code and by the way we... Um, in a sense, regulate properties. So I'm, I'm completely with you. I, I think some of this is, have you, have you read the Georgia stuff, the land value tax argument? No. Okay. Um, let me give you just very briefly. Um, there's a whole, there's a guy named Henry George who wrote a book. If you've ever played Monopoly, Monopoly's based off of Georgia's ideas. Um, you got to be careful with Georgia's because it's kind of a religion. Like they think they can cure cancer and solve Mitty's peace and all that with a land value tax. Land value tax won't do all the great things you want to do, but it will do one thing specifically. What the land value tax does is instead of taxing the land and what you built on it, it only taxes the land. So the more you build, your taxes don't go up unless it brings up the value of the land. Now think about this from the city standpoint. If we go out as a community, right, and that's what the city is, it's, it's like our, 
board of directors for the community, um, if the community goes out and puts in a road, sewer, water, sidewalk, that's a significant investment. But your taxes don't go up at all to reflect that investment until someone builds on it. So what happens quite frequently is that properties either sit vacant, sit empty, there's lots of empty lots, or they start to fall apart and you get the slumlord effect. With the land tax, when you go out and make that investment, the land goes up in value and your taxes go up in value. Now, uh, the, the, in a sense, if this person builds a house and this person doesn't, they're right next to each other, they both pay the same amount of taxes. And they should because they have the same amount of public services. Not, not to rain in your parade. Yeah, yeah, go for it. But I know I listened to one part of your talk and you talked about the value of homes for people is going to go up and maybe if it goes up for one person, are you going to be sad if, you know, you're going to double the value of your home? There are a lot of people who own homes. I don't care if my property of my home goes down to a dollar or it's a million dollars. I own my home. We need to get people in homes. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of greed that's going on. And quite frankly, there is some greed by the cities and their taxation. It, no doubt. And, and greed, greed slash desperation. I think and, it's touchable. To take that a step further, you would never drive through any community of the city if, it, if the people who were incentivized to say, okay, let's get people who can't afford the homes. You talked about mm -hmm. the poor, the house poor, yeah. and those who can't afford to get into homes. Get them that house they can do it. Say, we're going to do that. We're going to give you these grants for do stuff. We're going to give you a tax abatement for five years, mm -hmm. you know, for doing these things. Yeah. You would never have a slum in a city. Yeah, totally That's agree just with a couple you. of my comments. Agree with you. Yeah, no, we're on the same page. Cities have a lot of capacity through the assessment system to, uh, to make some of these investments, and they really need to do that. Please, go ahead. I'm all out of breath. Um, so you were talking at this, uh, as you were speaking uh, with the housing bubble yeah. that it then caused um, a lot of houses to be on the market, um, which were then picked up by the baby boomers, et cetera, because the millennials didn't have the, the means in they're, order to They're actually them. picked up by, a, a lot of them were picked up by uh, hedge funds and banks and others who were essentially going to rent them out. Using, yeah, so uh, I'm yeah. not sure where I was going with as an investment property because investment once property. they're used as an investment property, then there is another player in the, in, the, in the park who then has to be making money off this, which then increases the value or the, increases the cost of housing. Yeah. Um, is there, and maybe this is a question more for City Hall than for yourself, but is there any movement towards making... Uh, putting laws or regulations on how much property can be owned as rental. Um, mm. Because I know that if we were to decrease the amount, well, I, it's intuitive that if, we, that if we were to decrease the rent, the amount of rental properties, yeah. that would obviously then increase the amount of properties for sale, which would soften the cost. Sure, sure. Um, I have seen places try to do that. Um, I, you're asking me, I, I, yeah. I, I doubt the logic of it in a, in a marketplace. Um, you know, if, if, there's an argument that if we have too many renters, it, it, it decreases property values. And, you know, the most valuable real estate in North America is Manhattan, and it's almost all renters, right? It's like a very high percentage of renters. So the correlation is not... Sorry, no, I think my argument would be that um, having property as rental property automatically increases the value of it because there's, um, because there's an extra person that's having to draw a profit from it. It's not just the bank that's making the profit from the mortgage. It's the owner of the property that's making a profit, which then goes that's on to the price of the rental. That's an interesting argument. I've never heard that argument before. I think that might be true to a degree in a constrained market, right, where there's not enough rental properties to meet everybody's demand. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the last 10 years as, you know, iPads and all that have become more ubiquitous. It used to be really, really hard to run a rental company with a, a thousand rental units. Now, like Manhattan hedge funds are running rental companies because they can run it all off a, off a computer. You used to have to go to the house and do all this. And they, they have these algorithms that set the rent because they can actually look at the marketplace and kind of determine what the optimal rent will be to keep people you don't want out and, and maximize your revenue so they drive up the, the rents. But again, 
to me, that is a byproduct of a constrained market. So in other words, if there were 10% more units than there were demand, you would not have that upward pricing power. Yeah, but we're, I mean, talking about the first guy, he's talking that, and he's right, that we have issues with being able to create extra housing. So um, creating extra housing is a problem. Now, I think part of what you were saying with making supplemental <coughs> apartments within houses or, mm -hmm. or um, sort of the granny flat in the back, that sort of thing wouldn't yeah. be as expensive. And so I can think that I see that I could mitigate it. But I just feel that um, we found here in Medicine Hat, it was probably five or six years ago, a large company came down from Calgary, bought up a lot of the rental uh, properties, and now the rent is being increased dramatically. Yes. yes. Um, because, because they're doing exactly that, which then affects our affordable housing, right? Because the, it's all increased dramatically. Right. In no, you, you, you're absolutely right. And to me, the only way you deal with that is to have an abundance of those lower value, lower price units. Because what you... What you have right now is you have that shoe market where everybody's filtering down. Mm. And I'm saying you need to build lots and lots of penny loafers because then if you can't get in this, you can get in this and it creates, a, a, in a sense, a drag on how high those other prices can go and, and mitigates, basically allows a, a place for everybody. Mm. might not be the place you want, but there'll be a place for yes, everybody and a, like a, a, an anchor on prices, which is what we're trying to ultimately create. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go in the hallway, and I'm going to talk to whoever wants to stand out there and chat. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for being part of this. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all again. You've all been, this has been a wonderful, wonderful place to come and engage, and maybe we'll see you afterwards, or maybe we'll see you tomorrow.